All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Horvat, and on behalf of Recipe Plus, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, another presentation of the Expand Courses online training platform. Uh, today's webinar, Developing a Canadian Chronic Cough Network, will be presented by Dr. Imran Satya and Dr. Stephen Field. We're very pleased to offer this continuing education opportunity made possible by an unrestricted sponsorship from Merck Canada. Uh, just a couple of technical aspects before starting. If you're connecting to the webinar by phone, please note that your phone line will be muted uh, during the session. If uh, you have any questions at any point, we ask that you use the Q&A section that you should find um, towards the bottom of your screen, and we'll do the best to do our best to answer those questions at the end. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing via YouTube and our website, expandcourses.com. Uh, you'll get an email to this effect early next week. And in that same email, you will get uh, your attestation of participation. So a quick introduction to our speakers. Dr. Imran Satya is an international renowned expert in the field of chronic cough. He's currently an assistant professor at McMaster University for the Department of Medicine Division of Respirology. He completed his medical degree at the University of Cambridge in the UK and also completed a PhD at the University of Manchester. He was a co-author on the most recent ERS chronic cough guidelines and is a scientific advisor for pharmaceutical companies developing new cough therapies. He has been an invited speaker at national and international medical conferences and has authored numerous publications on the mechanisms and treatment of cough. Dr. Stephen Field is a respirologist at Foothills Medical Center and clinical professor at the University of Calgary. Practicing for over 40 years, he has won awards for undergraduate, resident, and continuing medical education. He is a large respiratory consultative practice and worked in the tuberculosis, non-tuberculosis mycobacterial, asthma, and CF clinics. He co-founded the Calgary COPD and Asthma Program and founded the Calgary Cough Clinic. Dr. Field has participated in numerous clinical investigations and published over 100 articles in peer-reviewed journals, as well as many abstracts, book chapters, and communications. And with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Satya and Dr. Field and invite them to begin their presentation. Thank you, Emily, and thank you to all of you for uh, uh, logging into listening to this uh, lunchtime uh, webinar. Uh, today's session is going to be slightly different. It's going to be presented uh, by myself and, and, and Dr. Stephen Field. And uh, it's going to, I'm going to try, or we're going to try to make it more conversational uh, and try and hopefully answer some of your questions, which you can, uh, I think, put in the chat function. So these are my uh, faculty disclosures. And these are Dr. Stephen Fields. So, so there's kind of three main learning objectives that I wanted to, or we wanted to talk about. Um, the first one is that discuss the need and how to run a chronic cough clinic. And this will differ from location to location, which we'll, which we'll hear about. Defining areas of research and education and training. And finally, what would a cough network across Canada look like? So I suppose the first question many of you will be thinking about is, why should we bother creating a chronic cough network? And the first answer to this is the fact that chronic cough is a common problem. And if you look at the meta-analyses around the world at how common this is, on average, uh, it's about 10% uh, in, in this study. And at the time of conducting this study, there was no data looking at Canada. You'll see there's a big empty space in Canada. And you'll notice that the prevalence is as high as 18% in Australia. Um, Europe is about 12%. America is about 11%. And in Asia and Africa, it's about 4 to 2%. And in Europe, it varies from 4 to 12%. Um, but there wasn't any data on Canada. And more recently, we've been able to uh, look at the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging, which is uh, uh, patients who are participants in the community, in the general community, who are the age of 45. Uh, 30,000 of them were recruited in approximately 2011 to 13, and then they will be followed up every three years for the next 20 years. Uh, and they were asked a question of whether they have a daily uh, chronic cough for the last 12 months. And 16% at baseline said yes. Uh, so this is the second highest in the world. Um, and as you can see, it increases with age. 
Um, it's predominantly um, one of the common risk factors is smoking in, in the green uh, area uh, in, in bars. Uh, non-smokers is, is less. Um, and even in the non-smokers and former smokers, it's still about um, 10 to 14 percent on average. Uh, so it's still common even in uh, non-smokers and, 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 and even former smokers. And the other interesting thing we found was the prevalence was much lower in Quebec than in Ontario. Um, so the French speaking province was was about uh, five or six percent lower. And the incidence uh, between baseline and follow up three years later was also four percent lower. Prevalence can also vary by airflow obstruction, uh, worsening FEV1, the presence of other symptoms and asthma and COPD. And the incidence pattern is all, also exactly the same. Um, and chronic cough is associated with other comorbidities, particularly cardiorespiratory here, pneumonia, hypertension, heart attacks. But interestingly also, um, neurological disorders like migraine, chronic pain, mood disorders, anxiety and depression, and more recently, we've been looking more into this, that some people have always thought of, you know, if you've been having chronic cough for many years, perhaps that chronic cough causes depression and, and psychological distress. But in this study, we showed that independent of age, sex, smoking, and all the other risk factors, psychological distress and depressive symptoms are independent risk factors for developing chronic cough by about 20 to 22%. But personality traits here, the big five personality traits of extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, emotional stability, and openness to new experiences, they weren't independent risk factors, although there was a bit of a trend when it came to conscientiousness. So uh, if you were low, had low conscientiousness scores, then you were approximately 20% more likely to develop chronic cough, although this wasn't statistically significant. The other issue was related to language and, and location. And as I mentioned, we were slightly intrigued by the differences between Quebec and Ontario. So we stratified the analysis based on whether they were English speaking or French speaking. So amongst English speaking uh, participants of the Canadian general community, what we notice here that is compared to Ontario, which is the reference range, people in Quebec, there was an almost 41% reduced risk of developing chronic cough if you were English speaking in Quebec, which, which, is, which is strange, um, which is a big amount as well. And this was statistically significant. And then it was less in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and slightly less in British Columbia, Alberta, and Manitoba, but which didn't meet statistical significance. So the, so the lesson from here was if you were English speaking, but living in different parts of Canada, your risk was lower. But if you were French speaking, although generally you tend to, the incidence and prevalence was lower, it didn't make a difference whether you lived in Ontario or Quebec. Your risk was very similar. We don't know exactly why this might be the case, but there's issues like climate, pollution, social understanding of chronic cough, and, and, and potentially even speech. So what's interesting is that in the previous slide, I demonstrated that um, being male was, was a higher risk factor for chronic cough than being female. But in specialty clinics, there's more females than males. And we don't fully understand why that is the case. One of the reasons that I was given is that females who have chronic cough have a more severe and troublesome chronic cough, and therefore they seek medical attention. Uh, whereas for males, although they may have the cough, it might not be as bothersome. That could be one explanation. But generally we see this in more specialty clinics where cough peaks in the 50s and 60s, uh, and it's twice as more common in females and males. So based on some of this evidence, uh, the Canadian community physicians, respirologists, allergists, pharmacists, we got together and we created a document. And the guiding principles of this document was, we need to investigate to rule out serious underlying conditions. We need to make sure that we get the right diagnosis to prevent over and under diagnosis of other conditions like asthma, COPD, or allergic rhinitis. And therefore we then treat those specific diseases or traits. And then once we've diagnosed and treated and, and, and started treatment, it's important to monitor patients to ensure uh, effectiveness and to monitor and reduce side effects and titrate treatment. So based on these principles, we then came up with this step one, two, and three approach. Step one is to check, test, and refer urgently if there's signs of red flags like hemoptysis, weight loss, fever, or an abnormal chest x-ray. 
It's important to check the cough history, assess cardiorespiratory, GI and nasal symptoms, ACE inhibitor and smoking. And again, this is partly because of the data that we've seen from the CLSA. Uh, but it's also important to look for spirometry and reversibility for airways disease, do a chest x-ray and, and a complete blood count. And then from a management perspective, we, we've tried to say that, you know, only treat if you feel that there's evidence of asthma, COPD, chronic rhinosinusitis or, or reflux disease. And if there isn't any evidence of this, then not to treat. And that's something which is important not to, you know, um, uh, we feel as if not to um, expose patients to treatment without any objective evidence. Uh, obviously, smoking cessation and, and changing ACE inhibitors is important. If the cough persists in secondary care, uh, our job is essentially to check and confirm the diagnosis with more um, uh, advanced testing. And I will point out here that in my practice, uh, I don't do all of these. I only do these in those patients who I suspect there's a problem with their esophagus or their nose or their throat. I don't do it in everybody and I don't do bronchoscopies in everybody. Um, but I do do uh, methacholine challenge and, and, and reversibility and spirometry in most people. I also then also assess their cough by at least asking on a zero to 10 scale uh, how severe their cough is. Um, I also run research trials, and in some of those, uh, we do the Lester cough questionnaire or the visual analog scale, and I treat based on finding those diseases. And then we would recommend that if the cough persists, despite treatment of these, then you would consider uh, speech uh, therapy, which consists of education, cough suppression exercises, cough avoidance strategies, reducing laryngeal irritation, and also counseling. Um, and you can consider this along with neuromodulators, which were guideline uh, recommended. None of these are uh, licensed for cough. These are off-label use, I, I'd point out, uh, like pregabalin, gabapentin, morphine, and amitriptyline. Um, and then to assess the benefit, and if the benefit is there, then to monitor side effects and titrate dose. And if there's no benefit, to try an alternative agent or recruit into a clinical trial. In the interest of time, I'm going to, I'm going to skip over this. Um, but I'm going to just mention that um, chronic cough is a, is, a, is a big field now, and there's lots of emerging therapies. Uh, the one medi uh, study or, or, or compound which has really uh, pulled through is this phase three uh, study, which was um, uh, done with Jefferpixant, which showed uh, it met its primary endpoint at 45 milligrams twice an hour. This is currently being reviewed by the FDA Health Canada European Medicines Agency. Um, and it's already approved in Japan and Switzerland for use. Uh, there are other molecules like the phase one, uh, the phase two Bella study, which is moving to phase three, uh, which is coming through. Other uh, Older um, studies uh, for trip A1 antagonists didn't make it through. Uh, sodium channel blockers haven't unfortunately made it through. Um, and uh, some of these other medications, which are, uh, for example, the bradyclinin didn't, didn't uh, pass um, uh, phase uh, two. Uh, so there's been lots of failures, but um, there has been uh, some success. Uh, and most of the successes have uh, been targeting this new channel called the P2X3. Um, and there's now uh, obviously the phase three program completed by Jeffrey Pixan, but also um, uh, Bellus is coming up behind in phase two and soon starting their phase three program. It's a shame that Bayer, who had a, a compound called Elia Pixant, unfortunately, because of safety reasons and severe adverse events, they, they didn't uh, move on to phase three. Um, but there's other medications coming out um, and other beings considered for other conditions like cough in ILD, which is ovepitant. Um, so I'm going to end it there and uh, open uh, a discussion with Dr. Stephen Field um, about, you know, he's in Canada, he's probably been the leading person who's been managing cough over the last, or chronic cough over the last 30, 40 years. And I wanted to just get his insights uh, into some of the challenges uh, related to managing chronic cough and what his experiences are. Well, thank you, Imran. I think that the, the major challenge is that the uh, demand uh, uh, overwhelms the supply of uh, people that can manage cough. Mm. And uh, we see lots of people with cough that, uh, you know, really 
uh, are, you know, are, uh, the family doctors are struggling with them for a number of reasons. And I thought maybe I'll just at this point, perhaps just uh, talk a little bit about my presentation. Mm -hmm. Sure. I think... Um... You have remote. Okay. Um, control. Uh, not yet. Before you begin that, I, I was just wondering, um, sure. um, you know, one of the things I've noticed in, in Canada generally is that um, most centers and, and clinics, patients with chronic cough are generally divided up into all the respiratory physicians. Um, and everybody sees a bit of chronic cough uh, and very rarely maybe apart from myself and yourself and maybe other uh, clinic in Louis-Philippe, that me most centers don't have a dedicated cough clinic. Ha have, have you noticed, is that your experience as well, that there's no kind of dedicated cough clinic? I, I agree with that. And well, one of the challenges is that uh, oh, these patients often are not popular patients for the respiratory doctors. They want mm -hmm. to avoid them because a lot of the people are not coughing uh, because of lung disease, but of other conditions like upper airway conditions, uh, mm. uh, gastroesophageal, ref gastroesophageal reflux. Some of them have, uh, you know, what we call, of course call unexplained chronic cough. Mm. And these can be frustrating uh, patients to deal with because we, you know, our armamentarium for managing these patients is less than optimal. Mm. Uh, patients with, uh, you know, uh, trial of PPI is very popular, uh, mm. uh, proton pump inhibitors is a very popular option that people try, uh, whether patients actually are experiencing symptomatic gastroesophageal reflux or not. And our experience has been that if patients are do not experience symptoms of reflux, they mm. really generally uh, don't benefit mm. from treatment mm. of the condition. And we see a lot of patients who uh, will treat who, who do have reflux and cough will treat the reflux and control the reflux symptoms. Yet the cough will persist. Uh, a lot of a lot of patients, it isn't necessarily the acid that is is causing the cough, and they're experiencing non-acid reflux. And uh, mm -hmm. even even if you no matter how much PPI you use, these patients will still become symptomatic. Just as an example, upper airway disease is is always challenging. When these patients are referred to the ENTs, very often if they are they don't look like they require surgery, uh, the ENTs are not particularly interested in following them. And our experience is that a lot of them are are sent out with uh, prescriptions for proton pump inhibitors, even mm -hmm. though that's going to help very much. Uh, Stephen, uh, related to that, there's been a, a question in in the Q and A saying sure. that. Can you discuss a bit about how you work with primary care with the recommendation not to treat until you have identified the underlying condition? Patients are suffering before or during the workup and want relief, if only temporary or partial. You know, what, what would you say to that kind of comment where people are suffering, they've got chronic cough, they want something quick? You know, it's, it's hard to say no and let's do some testing first before beforehand. Sure. Well, I'd say that there definitely is a role for in, in, for empiric trials in these patients, and very often it, the uh, potential cause will be obvious. And these patients will have uh, um, a post nasal drip, or uh, you know, other air, upper airway symptoms, or they will be experiencing uh, symptoms of reflux. Some patients will will um, experience cough with exercise and perhaps are wheezing at time from time to time. And so obviously those patients potentially mm. could have cough variant asthma. So I think that there often are a lot of clues. Uh, there undoubtedly this is a challenging, uh, this is a challenging um, uh, population for family practice to deal with because uh, these patients often require some time and and uh, uh, and, you know, the hectic setting of a typical family mm -hmm. practice is not the best place for, or yeah. not the easiest place to manage these patients. I, I agree, Stephen. And, yeah. No, I was just going to say that absolutely there, there is a role for empiric trials, but I think that, you know, often there are clues uh, to, you know, as to what particular treatment might be useful. Yeah, I agree with that, Stephen. I mean, from, from I, su I suspect in family practice, one of the commonest things that are prescribed are PPIs and inhalers. 
But if the patient says, I don't have heartburn, I don't have reflux, my cough got worse after meals or lying down, then it's highly, highly unlikely it's gastroesophageal reflux disease, be that acid or non-acid. And likewise for asthma, so you can give something. If somebody says yes to those questions, then yes, go, go ahead and try it on that basis. And likewise for conditions like asthma, I remember Sean Aaron's has, has shown this numerous times now and presented this, that you know approximately 30% of asthmatics are who are diagnosed with asthma or overdiagnosed with asthma. Um, and you know, it's important that objective testing is available, reversible to methacholine challenge in most places. Um, so we should use that, you know. And I think part of this is changing mentality. I think none of us would treat diabetes without confirm doing a, you know, a, a glucose test or an oral food glucose challenge or, or even a HbA1c. We wouldn't treat blood pressure without checking blood pressure. Uh, and we wouldn't, you know, give somebody um, treatment for coronary artery disease without, without checking the heart. So I think it's the same thing with chronic cough. I think there's a reluctance maybe to, to do testing and give treatment quickly, but I think we have to probably move towards, um, you know, checking first before we, uh, before we uh, improve the treat everybody, maybe in selected people, as you say, uh, who have uh, clues in their diagnosis. The, the other question maybe whilst we've got a couple of minutes to move into the next section, is that why do you think that phys physicians and respiratory physicians and trainees often feel that the chronic cough patient is the heart sink. Is it just because they don't understand it, the disease and the and, and the mechanisms, and there's no treatment that's being offered? It, it, do you re really think that is the thing which is kind of not really creating a momentum around this condition? And do you think that with new treatments and better understanding, we can get over that hill? I think that that will help. And I agree with you. I mean, one of the challenges is that these patients uh, uh, become albatrosses. Uh, you know, they, uh, you know, they're seen. Uh, attempts are being made to manage them, and particularly those patients who, you know, we now define as having refractory or unexplained chronic cough, mm. are a frustrating group. And most respirologists, as most of the community, don't have rapid enough access to. Um, to uh, voice clinic or a speech therapy group that will take these patients on and, and teach them the appropriate exercises. Um, as you mentioned, uh, you know, there are, I mean, we're hoping that, um, you know, that uh, medications like Jefepixent and perhaps Sivupixent, if it gets through the, um, um, you know, the clinical trial process will be helpful to manage these patients. I think that, you know, uh, in all of the studies, one of the things that has impressed me has been the uh, the impressive response to placebo therapy in in this group of patients, and that you know that tells me that uh, you know that there is more to chronic cough than um, than sometimes meets the eye. I think that um, a lot of these people, if they're if they are given um, some strategies to manage their cough, it can help quite a bit. And in our clinic, our emphasis on cough avoidance and cough suppressive strategies has proved to be quite helpful for a large number, not all the patients, but for a large number of the patients that we see. I think with that segue, I think it would be good to uh, move into your sections about what your sure. lessons and insights from the Calgary Clinic. I'm just going to hand it over to you to uh, hang on. Sorry. Okay, let me try and see if it works. I'm going to give it to you now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. It's okay. Moving. Well, thank you, Imran. So, you know, an obvious question, if, if chronic cough is potentially so simple to treat, why are these patients referred to a specialist? And as I started to mention, this is a frustrating condition for family doctors to manage. You know, they often lack the time for patient education and reassurance uh, that's necessary in, in the management of these patients. And the hectic setting of a typical family practice is really not conducive to achieving these goals. Uh, and if patients, uh, patients, if they don't understand the condition, they won't understand the rationale for management. So someone comes in for a cough and they're told, oh, well, you take a heartburn medication, and they go to the pharmacy and find out how much it's going to cost and don't really understand the rationale for it. They may not fill the prescription. 
And if they don't under and if they don't understand the condition and the potential response to it, they may try medication for, for a very short time. And if it doesn't help them, it won't continue it long enough for them to experience a therapeutic response uh, that they're hoping for. Oops, sorry. So another important consideration is that chronic cough represents a significant burden on respiratory resources. And, you know, a frustrating issue for the specialist is that since most of these are benign and often not due to lung disease, especially in the respiratory group, they aren't keen to manage them. And in Calgary, we were experiencing the situation where some specialists were refusing to see them. And this was resulting in long wait lists for these patients. And so to deal with this backlog, we suggested that certified respiratory educators could help deal with these patients. And we thought that you know, the educators would be ideally, potentially ideally suited to manage these patients once sinister conditions are excluded. So obviously a patient like this to demonstrate on the CT scan with a lung, with a lung cancer is not the sort of patient that we wanna be see referred to a certified respiratory educator. But we know that the uh, differential diagnosis of the chronic cough overlaps that with asthma, which is something that the certified respiratory educators are, are uh, well experienced with and have the appropriate knowledge for. And these patients often need spirometry, often need education about asthma and conditions in the differential diagnosis of asthma. And, 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 and if they're going to be uh, prescribed inhalers, they need to be able to use them properly. And these are all things that the re certified respiratory educators are expert in. They also have uh, time to discuss the patient's symptoms. They would have the time to experience, uh, you know, which conditions contribute to cough, the importance of adherence to a prescribed regimen, the proper way to use the different inhalers and medications. And so we got approval to start our clinic and our CREs are seeing over 200 new referrals a year. When we initially received funding from the regional health authority, we thought it was important to validate the model so that they would be convinced to continue funding it. So for that reason, we carried out a study compared the, comparing the outcomes of patients managed by CREs to those managed by respirologists. So in, the, in this particular study, we screened out cases with potentially sinister causes. As I said before, you know, we didn't want the CREs to be managing serious health conditions like lung cancer and tuberculosis. So of the approximate 500 referrals we received, um, sorry, um, we, um, we randomized 200 to be seen either by a respiratory educator or a respirologist. And this was an eight week study. We were looking for a response within eight weeks. And so uh, the certified respiratory educators followed a, st a strict anatomic based protocol in which they saw the patients initially. There was a phone call at two weeks. They were seen again at four weeks, another phone call at six weeks, and then they were seen again at eight weeks. And the respirologists did what they normally did. We thought that we, you know, we really wanted to see how the CREs managed against real world experience. And also we thought that trying to get a bunch of doctors to do something by protocol would be like trying to herd cats. We wouldn't be particularly uh, uh, successful at that. I should clarify though, that the CREs reviewed the new patients with physicians and the physicians uh, wrote prescriptions and had to sign the investigation orders. We actually wanted to keep the CREs and the physicians in completely separate silos, but the Alberta College of Physicians, the CMPA and Alberta Health Services, which is a CRE employer, insisted that uh, there be involvement with the physicians. But really, our involvement was minimal. They, we uh, spent virtually no time with the patients and really just uh, gave, gave the patients uh, you know, recommendations once we heard the study. And often the follow-up visits were done without our involvement unless patients required prescriptions or, or investigations uh, approved. Um, <clears throat> so, And the primary outcome in this uh, study was change in cough-specific quality of life. And we used the, the University of Massachusetts questionnaire. And the reason was, is that this one was validated in a North American uh, population, which we thought was more like ours. And also is a, was a more comprehensive questionnaire than the Lester Cough questionnaire. And we were looking at the change between when the patients were seen initially 
and at the end of the eight-week study. Oops. I'm having trouble advancing here. There we go. So this was the protocol that the educators used. Uh, and so if the patients were uh, still smoking, then obviously uh, they were counseled, uh, they were counseled regarding smoking cessation. And if smoking cessation aids were required, those were prescribed. If the patients were on medication, such as an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor uh, that could be contributing to cough, they were switched to another antihypertensive. And then uh, further management uh, dependent on, dependent on uh, what um, uh, uh, you know what their symptoms were like. And I should mention that all patients, uh, as part of the screening, all patients had spirometry and a chest X-ray and had to have a normal chest X-ray to be randomized. And also not have any uh, concerning symptoms or signs like, or uh, you know, coughing up blood, obviously, uh, fever, sweats, weight loss. Any of these things were exclusion were exclusionary for this study. And so, if the patients uh, had, if their symptoms suggested they might have reflux, uh, they were given a trial of PPIs. We might also consider motility agents. And if they didn't improve, uh, we would uh, proceed to recommend a, a GI investigation. And the reason that we we started with empiric therapy is that in Calgary, wait times for ambulatory pH monitoring and uh, motility studies are in the range of six months. If rhinitis was uh, suspected, uh, patients were given trials of antihistamines, and we usually used one of the older antihistamines, particularly for use at night because they are a bit sedating, along with a decongestant, unless the patients had hypertension. We also use saline rinses. If appropriate, we might uh, use an epitropium spray to help control um, uh, secretions. And if, uh, if, if there was a suggestion that there was an allergic basis to their um, to their respiratory, to their nasal symptoms, then we would use a nasal spray. And if that didn't work, then we would go on to imaging and uh, possibly recommendation for an ENT. And so, as I said, all of the patients uh, had had spirometry and obviously if they had reversibility, then uh, they were given empiric trial of uh, inhaled steroids. Um, if they didn't respond, then we would go on to a methacholine or depending if we thought that if they might have um, Eosinophilic bronchitis, we would use to go for induced sputum analysis, and they still didn't respond. We consider high resolution CT scan to rule out bronchiectasis or other respiratory conditions. Mm -hmm. I'm having trouble advancing again. All oh, right, sorry. So the primary outcome in this study was changes in, in total quality, it, in, it was change in. Um, cough specific quality of life. And what we found was that quality of life, there were significant, statistically significant improvements in quality of life in both the physician and the uh, CRE group. And the improvement was similar in the two groups. What we found though, was that if we looked at the proportion of patients that experienced symptomatic improvement, the group that improved greater was actually was the educator group rather than uh, the respir than the respiratory physicians. Oops, too far. So, what we also found, not surprisingly, since there was a strict protocol for the educators. They actually, on average, in the eight-week period, had four and a half contacts with the patients compared to approximately two and a half for the physicians. And I think that this probably explains why they had a, at least a, a, um, a as um, turned by the proportion of patients uh, that improved, actually had a better, res better response than the physician group. There were more, more potential, uh, more options uh, for intervention. So we also did a cost analysis, and I want to make the point that I am no economist, but we added up the costs, and we found that not surprisingly, the cost of management by a respiratory educator was less than that of a physician. Although the one area that, that the um, educator spent more money 
with than the physicians were investigations and treatment. And I think this reflects the, the fact that they had more opportunities to interact with the patient and there were uh, uh, more opportunities to, to make adjustments. And so if we looked at the total cost, though, the total cost was definitely uh, less with the CREs. And particularly if you look at the proportion of patients who experienced an improvement or resolution of their cough, there was a significant difference in cost with a definite advantage to patients being seen by CREs. And this, of course, is uh, helped convince the, um, the health authority to continue, um, uh, to, to continue funding our clinic. So we also went back and looked at how these patients were doing at six months, even though they were only they were not being followed. We did question them, and we found that the improvement that uh, was present at eight weeks persisted at six months. And so these were patients who had a, a, a cough median duration of 16 months. The average cough duration, because they were some patients who've been coughing for decades, was five and a half years. But the median uh, duration of cough was about 16 months. And over the eight-week period, approximately two-thirds of them experienced symptomatic improvement. And this improvement was maintained at six months. So we felt that this really represented a success. So in summary, our cough clinic freed up uh, time for respirologists and shortened patient wait times. Patients in both arms experienced equivalent improvements in quality of life. We showed that it was safe. One thing I forgot to mention is, is that you know, our screening was relatively effective. Um, the, uh, of the 500 patients we screened, there were four patients with normal x-rays that turned out to have mild bronchiectasis, which we did not, uh, and the got entered in the study. And there was one patient with um, a uh, with um, normal with a normal chest x-ray and normal spirometry who had interstitial lung disease, but did have a reduced diffusion capacity. So there were five of the 200 patients randomized inappropriately, and the rest were not. We didn't miss any cancers. And this is, uh, uh, and so we felt that, that it was a safe, uh, safe study and a safe, um, and, a, and a safe way to manage patients. And as I pointed out, there were cost savings. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was that was excellent. I had a couple of questions about about the model. In that, the first question was: Is that you know what was it like trying to apply for funding in in Alberta for this, and and, and how long did it take, and what what was the process like? Well, it um, if you want to start sticking needles in every part of your body, that's kind of what it was like. Mm. So what happened was is that when we were starting our uh, alternative funding model here, mm. there was a call for innovation. And so there were a number of applications and they did uh, fund a number of different clinics such as the heart failure clinic. And we were one of the ones that met it. So I, mm. I put together a proposal. Um, I presented it to our regional health authority and they made it very clear to me that the purpose of this clinic was um, clinical care and not research. And I argued back and forth with them about the need for validating, uh, you, you know, I mean, there's no point in, in trying to innovate if you don't actually prove that something's going to work yeah. and that yeah. validation was important. And so there was a back and forth for about a year. And then at that point, the people from Edmonton came down from Alberta Health. And they basically told the region that they wanted to see validation. And so the region immediately said, oh, well, Dr. Field has a proposal. And so I was at a meeting and without any warning, I presented our, our proposal. Mm. And so that actually was very good. I was actually delighted that happened because once I had the government behind me, I knew that uh, I was going to get funded. Move. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we showed it worked and it's still working and it's still popular. Um, I must say that we have liberalized uh, our, um, our inclusion criteria. So we are actually, we actually are seeing a fair number of patients referred by other respiratory doctors who have documented underlying 
health problems like interstitial lung disease, mm. asthma, COPD, in whom cough is a major issue. Mm. And, and a lot of these patients, uh, I mean, some of the cough is, is due to, um, to their underlying lung disease, mm. but some of the cough is due to other conditions. Some of them have rhinitis, some of them have mm. reflux that could be better controlled. And some of them, uh, there is an element, even though they do have an underlying disease that's contributing to their cough, some of their cough, I think, would qualify as refractory or unexplained chronic cough. Mm. And some of the, and we do improve the situation for a number of these patients. So we are seeing uh, a lot, of, a lot of patients referred. But you know, the patients that come from elsewhere, we screen them very carefully to make sure mm. that there's not other significant. Uh, and other significant underlying disease. And, and just a follow up question before we move on, Stephen, is is that do you think that the right model is when you have a referral come through the door from the family physician, that even before you see the patient or the CRE sees the patient, that you would invest, you know, request a chest X ray, spirometry, and, and some basic tests. And then if all of those come back negative, then they go to the CRE? Or is it that you see them once? you do the investigations, and if they're then normal, then they go to CRE. What was so, the... So what we do is, is that most of the patients, so, you know, we have um, in, in Calgary now, we have a, a central triage uh, office for respiratory consults. And so, the, you know, we ask for patients to have a chest X-ray and spirometry prior to them being referred to the cough clinic. Sure. There are patients being referred to the central triage office that do not have either spirometry or chest x-ray, sometimes neither. And so these get done before we book the patients into the clinic. I see. And if the patients clearly have underlying disease, then we don't want them to be seen in the clinic. I mean, unless, of course, they've been referred by a respiratory physician, particularly mm. to focus on the cough. And, and, the, the, these, and these patients will be, um, and these patients will uh, be seen elsewhere rather than in the clinic. I see. I see. Okay, that, that's really helpful. There is a question. I want to try and see if I can answer it. Sure. I'll bring it up. Uh, Paul Hernandez is asking, do you have access to speech pathologists in your clinic? Or no. Do the educators do this role? I think the educators do it, right? Exactly. So, so what happened was, is that we sent one of our educators to work with Murray Morrison, who is uh, now emeritus, but he was an ENT at the uh, Vancouver General Hospital, who ran a voice clinic. And so she went there and learned these techniques, and she's taught the other uh, CREs these techniques. And so we we use them. Uh, there is, uh, there are speech therapists. Um, one of the challenges is that uh, the um, most patients will not have financial coverage to see the speech therapist. Mm. And even if they do, uh, there are large wait times. And during the pandemic, a lot of them have not been seeing patients face to face. Yeah. Whereas yeah. we have been. Yeah. So, so this is a important thing, which I've noticed even in McMaster is that access to even investigations and speech therapists and some, some of these, more advanced tests, you know, it can take six months to a year and, you know, nobody's going to wait that long. And, and if you're out of province or out of your local authority, then it's not funded. So uh, pe people run into issues. Uh, one of the issues that I think we should talk about um, in, in the third section is about, you know, given that you've spent a lot of time with the CREs and, and the cough model and, and, and this clinic, is that what do you think has been really helpful from an education and training perspective? Uh, to run that cough clinic. Well, what kind of training have you given the CREs? Apart, you mentioned the speech therapist going away and learning that, but I know that they, they're involved in asthma, they have an understanding of asthma, but what has there been anything about cough specific training that you've given them? So um, what, what we've done, so initially when we started it, uh, so, all the pay, the, so the, they were all obviously CREs and they had that background. Mm. And so the actual cost specific training was was not very detailed. And what we've done is that we we have some experienced CREs, and as other ones have come in, they've uh, basically served as an apprenticeship. And really, it's only taken them a few weeks to get up to speed. 
Wow. And you know, I mean, obviously, there's always a, a shoulder, you know, with kind of a shoulder growth uh, mm. until people, you know, get up to full speed. But, uh, you know, over the years, we've had about, uh, we've taught these techniques to about 15 CREs. And some of them have even been working out in the community at various times and have dealt with cough mm. there away from us. And basically, you know, in family practice clinics, going basically telling the family doctor, well, this patient, this is the problem with this patient. Can you prescribe this? And mm. and you know, the family doctors have taken direction from the CREs. That's so, fascinating. Like that you've been able to bring that even forward from secondary into primary care in the community. Well, in in so, so they've there have been CREs in some of the uh, primary care units, mm. and uh, at various times. And so in that situation, we've done that. Not now with the CREs that have had the cough training. And mm. the ones that have been interested have come and have spent a few weeks in our clinic with our cough educators. Mm -hmm. Specific to education and training, do you think it's, you know, do you think it's really important like um, for physicians and educators and CREs to really know about the neurophysiology about chronic cough, novel treatments, how they work, airway nerves, you know, all of these things which, you know, are interesting from an academic perspective, but you know, what, what kind of basic information do you think they need to know about these things? Uh, because often patients ask, oh, what, what, what's wrong with me, doctor? Um, and you might say, oh, well, they have some hypersensitivity and you might go on and explain that. But do you, in your experience, do you, do you think we should be educating and training people around the neurophysiology of chronic cough or is that too much, do you think? I don't know, what do you think? I, I don't think that that's necessary for the CREs. I mean, we in our clinic, what, we, what we're calling in other places, uh, you know, refractory, unexplained chronic cough, we're, we're calling it irritable larynx syndrome. Mm. And so many of the patients actually feel the discomfort in the back of their throat. Mm. Uh, both the CREs and the patients are quite comfortable with that explanation. Mm. So that, you know, that's the approach we take. And, uh, you know, I don't start getting into the complexity of, of, um, of, uh, vagal afferents and, yeah. uh, central modulation and uh, and the different types of receptors. I mm. think that that would just cloud the issue. I mean, in, I mean, we so far, we still, we, we don't have uh, Jeffapixins or any of the other yeah. uh, medications available, readily available yet. And so they know that, you know, some of the patients we've gone through the speech therapy techniques and, you know, we're at the point of frustration. And at that point, we'll consider a trial of, usually uh, gabapentin or pregabalin. So I was going to ask you that, that uh, in, your, in your algorithm, you know, at what stage, because many people are, you know, I get referred people because people are somewhat reluctant to give people neuromodulators and antitussives and monitoring for side effects and dosing and all these kind of things. So when, when do, number one, when do you start kind of using these? And more importantly, you know, then how do you, uh, kind of uh, what kind of teaching and training do you think physicians need to have to make them more familiar and comfortable with with prescribing these? Well, I mean, I think absolutely they have to understand how to dose the medication and they have to know uh, what side effects to look for. And, uh, you know, with, um, you know, we, we uh, warn the patients that if they start these medications, uh, you know, don't start them on a day you're going to go on a long drive. Mm. Uh, uh, to notify us if they're experiencing any side effects from it, any, any drowsiness, any uh, stomach upset or anything. And, you know, I mean, obviously if, um, if the side effects are, are worse than, uh, than the disease, then this isn't something that we're going to maintain them on. We, we have um, a question here from Amy Rowlinson, uh, RT PCN working with PCN in Edmonton. We do not have specialist oversight and work with primary care physicians. Do you think a primary care chronic cough clinic can work without the immediate specialty link? Should patients be referred to a specialist first or should CREs triage and be able to make us that suggestion for specialty referral if unable to manage in primary care? Um, we can complete spider on request chest x-ray for initial appointment. Um, I think it's similar to the question that I asked about, about the, the role uh, of you know when to when where the role of the CRE is is it in in the community or is it you know does it have to be in a specialty? 
So, uh, I mean, I, I would actually like to test the model. I haven't uh, been able to do that. I, I was hoping to find uh, some interest out in some of our primary care networks to actually do the study. Mm. And I haven't been able to do that. And I, I would actually like to see us, you know, uh, in, you know, in a systematic fashion, export mm. the unit to the primary care. I think that obviously there would have to be a screening. As I said, I mean, we want to mm. make sure that... Uh, someone with uh, an enlarging lung cancer is uh, mm. is not being me. treated for refractory yeah. cough or something. So I think that, um, you know, that there would be very important caveats, but I think it is practical. And I think that the volume would warrant that sort of approach yeah. if we could get yeah. people to agree to it. Paul Hernandez has asked a question about, do you think uh, training programs like RESP TREC uh, should consider adding a chronic cough module? Uh, I would say yes. I don't have much experience with Respirac. Do you know Respirac, uh, Stephen? I think that that would be a, an excellent idea. So that's the program for the CREs. Uh, there, but I, I think that I would love to see it. Mm. You know, uh, I think that um, it would dovetail very nicely with their um, asthma and COPD expertise. Mm. Good. I think in the last uh, ten minutes, I suppose. I suppose we should kind of bring it back to the beginning of, you know, this idea of having a chronic cough network. And I think I hope that we've been able to explain to our listeners that um, chronic cough is a common problem in Canada. There's lots of people in the community who suffer with this who are probably not getting seen in primary care or secondary care. And even when they get referred to secondary care, they've been waiting for a long, long time to be seen and then investigated and treated. Um, so we really need a group effort across the country to be able to improve uh, the care of patients with chronic cough, make sure they're on the right treatment, sinister causes are excluded. Um, and, and the question really then is, is that, you know, a chronic, a chronic cough network, um, there's a kind of a need, clearly there's a need to have something across the country. Um, I think every it sounds like you know different provinces and different cities will have to have a different slightly different model um, but I think the model that you've described Stephen of having respiratory educators uh, or, or research nurses or, or, or things like this uh, seeing patients um, would be important um, and I wanted to kind of open it up to other health professionals as well and, and, and see what you think about you know because this potentially pharmacists who may be interested in, in joining a network like this because they see a lot of people taking over-the-counter cough syrups and medicines. Maybe they may be able to have a purpose of people who are have chronic cough and got side effects with pregabalin or gabapentin or morphine. Um, I think uh, physios, respiratory therapists um, have an important role to play uh, and physicians. We, we didn't really talk much about you know, other specialties like ENT and gastroenterologists and allergists. And, and what role they may be have. What, what's been your experience, Stephen, with working with other specialities and um, you know, the idea of um, including them in, in this kind of network? Well, I, I'd, be, I, I'd be delighted to. Um, you know, in Calgary, the wait list for a gastroenterologist is about 12 months. Wow. And an ENT is, I mean, it, for routine things, an ENT is several months. Uh, allergists are also very difficult to access. So that was that was one of the reasons that, um, you know, we went the route that that we did here, and and I think that, I think that there's, I mean, I think that you know it depends on the uh, on the. Um, mission of, of the cough clinic, okay? Mm. So I think that if, we, if, if we're if we in an ac academic center, we might be able to, and you know, research was a priority, then we could probably get um, more effective and more rapid input from, from other specialties. Mm. But I think that to manage most of the uh, clinical load, I think that, the model that we've been using here might be more practical. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, um, you know, the majority of our, uh, of the uh, CREs that we've had over the years have been respiratory therapists, but we've also had nurses mm -hmm. and we've had at least one pharmacist that I can recall 
Excellent. And all, all of them have been equally effective. Mm. So I, I, you know, your comment about involving, um, a, you know, a series with different disciplines, I think is a, is a very important point. There was a comment in the Q&A with exactly that point that there are CREs within other um, allied health professional broadly who, who, who could potentially take on this role as well. Absolutely. Uh, um, and, um, um, you know, so, so yeah, so I, I'm, I'm actually, um, the, 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 what you've, I think it's the first time I've actually been able to speak to you in detail about your Calgary model. And um, I think that could be something which other centers and other uh, people uh, could look into in more detail. Uh, to try and uh, uh, expand on. Um, I, the only issue is with regard to funding, which I wasn't quite sure about. I'm not sure what the case is in Ontario. Maybe you might know more than me. Is th these the CREs, are, are they centrally or provincially funded? and Or, or do you have to apply for the funding? Or how does it work? Or do you, is it ongoing funding forever in, in your clinic? Or does it get, how, how does it work, the funding model? So the, the funding isn't actually going to my clinic. Mm. So there is a um, uh, there is a an educator uh, program run through Alberta Health Services, and we have uh, we have certain educators that all allocated to us for cough. Okay, mm. and so actually the I'm not the only person in Calgary that's doing cough. So at our site, uh, some of the other uh, physicians who are here, Brandy Walker, Richard Lee, mm. uh, also uh, are also seeing cough patients. But at one, at two of our other hospitals, we have other respiratory doctors that are involved and have educators that are seeing cough patients. Uh, so Tara Lohman at the, at our mm. South Health Campus and Yuri Yanovchik at uh, the uh, Peter Lougheed Hospital. So, uh, you know, I, I don't. I think that this is this model definitely is exportable. I think that uh, you know there isn't anything special about what we're uh, about about being here at the foothill at, at our site i think that this is a model that could work in other places mm. and, and i think that i mean you know in the last few months we've just heard you know the the healthcare crisis across the country mm. i mean i think that um you know we have to use allied health professionals as much as possible and i think that um that this model and and similar models are are i think you know, are, are the wave of the future. Mm. I think um, Paul Hernandez has raised an important issue that do residents from other specialties like ENT, allergy, and GI raw fit through your cough clinic? And uh, would it be, it would be a good learning opportunity environment. So Paul, you know, uh, since I've been here for the last two or three years, I have had residents from internal medicine, GI, uh, allergy, uh, immunology, uh, and, but not ENT come to, to come to my cough clinic. I'm not sure about you, Stephen. Ha, has anybody um, come I've, to your I've, clinic? I've only had general internal medicine and respiratory trainees mm, yeah. uh, asked to come to the clinic. Yeah. At the moment, I don't have a CRE in my clinic. The way I do the, my clinic is that I, I try to do all the investigations pre-clinic, see them in clinic, um, and then make a decision about you know where I think this needs to go. Uh, I do have access to speech uh, pathologists, although the wait is long. Um, but because I'm running quite a few clinical trials, um, many patients uh, get enrolled into clinical trials, and in the clinical trials they'll have sputum induction, methacholine, skin prick test, a pheno breath assessment, LCQ, lots and lots of things, objective cough frequency measurements. So we're kind of doing these testing um, uh, in an indirect way, uh, where in other centers, these are not available. And that's why we then, people are coming to, to clinic to, to have those tests done. So uh, it's, it's uh, but then the research co study coordinators help with all those visits. Um, that might not last forever. Uh, and these some of these tests like 24 hour cough monitoring are expensive, um, which is funded purely through clinical trials uh, uh, and budgets. But um, it's something to, I think, work on. And I think we do need to have a more streamlined process uh, to be able to do this quicker and better. Um, my weight, uh, me, by the time they come to me, the median cough frequency in my clinic is about six years. 
so you've got it down to significantly less i think um, which which is a great testament to your work in calgary same um, well, i think i'm going to we're running out of time, I think. Hi, I, Imran, I was just going to say where we've come up on the, the one o'clock mark. So um, and I think we've answered all of the questions that have come through unless I don't see any yeah. new ones. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Satya, Dr. Field. Um, an amazing and comprehensive presentation on chronic cough and cough clinics, I think. You've done a really great job at expressing the current uh, challenges that many people face for managing chronic cough and, and how a network of professionals could, could help perhaps mitigate some of those challenges. There's any education and training needed uh, to be able to run a cough clinic. So thank you to all of our listeners for joining the webinar today. Um, and of course, to Merck Canada for helping us make this learning opportunity possible. Uh, don't forget to sign up to expandcourses.com. You'll be able to find the recording um, and access an attestation and many other learning opportunities. So thank you once again. Enjoy the rest of the day and I hope you can join us for the next one. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye everyone.